Hi guys, this is Michael Shakib from Swansea University in Project Metal and today I'm going to do a little video on tensile testing and really it's focus, this video sort of focuses on the data analysis from tensile testing and really it's for the people who attend the practical metallurgy course that we run um, who get sent out a spreadsheet with data on there from tensile testing and um, this is just to sort of give you a hand in trying to analyse that data and trying to figure out the different points on the curve and the importance of it. So let's run this animation on tensile testing. Let's have a little quick look. So I'll pause it there. It's a typical tensile testing specimen. This is EM1A. So this is a, a 0.1% carbon steel. And in this picture here, we've measured the gauge length of the specimen. And this measures about, about 35, um, 35 millimetres something like that. So what we do is we take this sample specimen and we put it into some sort of gripping mechanism. Yeah, some sort of fixture. And we insert that into the machine. There we go. That's a very quick test. Let's see what happened there if we slow it down. So let me pause that a second. So this top half here of the fixture, this is, um, this is your actuator. This moves up at a prescribed speed because this test is actually in something called displacement control and we'll have a look at that in a bit and as you can see this isn't the best sample to use because it's full of this um, decarburized layer however it pulls and pulls and pulls and eventually it will start to neck in this region here in this case and then we should get a failure there we go slow motion and this is the software we use here this is a Hounsfield testing machine and um, what we do is we prescribe the test speed, in this case in millimetres per minute. So we, we, move this, we move the crosshead at a rate of 2 millimetres per minute in displacement control, as opposed to load control or extension control, which you can use for other types of testing. We recorded data points every 0.2 seconds. We put a load limit and a displacement limit on there. So what is this machine actually doing? Well, we're moving at 2 millimetres per minute and we are measuring the force and we're actually measuring the position of the cross head as well and we're measuring the time um, which we can use for sort of strain rate measurement as well but we're not worried about that at the moment we're really just focusing on these two parameters here the force and position so what's this, what does the data look like from these um, from these tests I'll open one up now and I'll show you but before I do that actually let me move this out of the way this is an example of a failed sample where the whole thing is extended. We started off at 35 millimeters. Now we're up to uh, almost four and a half millimeters. And we see a classic necked region here, typical sort of ductile failure, um, where we necked into a point and then failed. Okay. So if I go ahead now and actually open up the test data that came from a similar test. So if you open up some raw data, what you'll find is from this particular this very particular situation from this bit of software we're using, um, all different tensile tests will come from their own, will come with their own bits of software packages from the manufacturer, and they'll have all sorts of different ways um, that they present data to you. This is just the way our machine presents data. It's really simple. We have a time column, a displacement column, and a force column. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is going to tell you something that for some reason um, the way the machine program has been written the displacement is actually measured in microns in them um, in this case okay so in order to well in fact before we do anything let's put a bracket in there and let's type in microns a micrometer microns okay the force was measured in newtons so i'm just going to put n there force is measured in newtons now i'm going to select all this data here and on a Mac is shift command and I'm going to press down and what that does is selects all and pull this up to full screen as well it selects all the data that has this selects all, all of the rows and columns that all the rows rather that has data in them and I'm going to move this down a little bit and we'll see why extend these out okay now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plot a graph of displacement and force. So again, highlight the two rows, shift command, 
I'm not sure what it is on a, a PC. And make sure that we've just selected the date that we want. And I'm going to go into Insert, Scatter, and just insert a simple scatter graph. Now then, we have a curve where we have force in newtons on the y-axis and displacement in microns on the x-axis. Now I've done this because I want to just analyze the data in quite a crude manner at the uh, just for now. Um, this looks a lot like a stress strain curve, although it's a force extension curve. What we can see here is this is where the test failed and this is where the machine was still recording data okay after the test had failed so what I'm going to do is go ahead and just delete off those data points there and it should be really obvious yeah there we go that's where the test failed so I'm just going to delete those data points we don't need them and when we go back up we should see that they're gone the machine didn't start off at zero because uh, we forgot, probably the person who did this forgot to zero the machine off of zero. But we can we can do something about that. But let's just leave it for now. Let's just leave that that force value there. All right. Now above here, I'm going to start typing in something. I'm going to say I'm going to type in specimen dimensions. Now what do we, what do we actually want to know? Well, we want to work out the stress and strain. So to do that, we're going to need the original length of the specimen, which we saw. Um, was 35 millimeters. However, I know that um, this particular test was done, was performed with a specimen that had a gauge length of 27 millimeters. So I'm going to type 27 millimeters. I also know that it had a diameter, so I measured it, of 5 millimeters. Okay. Now then, this is unusual data because, like I said, um, it's been, for some reason, the machine measures in microns. So the first thing I want to do is actually convert microns into millimeters because we can then keep our units consistent. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a new column. And I'm going to convert microns to millimeters and to do that we simply just divide by 1000 and then if I click on this little thing here there we go so 34 microns is now 0 0.034 millimeters and let's go down and make sure everything's sorted out great wonderful so this now is our displacement this is our extension so if I want to work out the strain What's the equation for strain? Well, let's go back to our course notes. So we've got a practical metallurgy and course notes. And we want to produce an average stress, average strain curve. So strain, engineering strain. Well, this is simply the changing length divided by the original length. Well, where do we get our change in length measurement from? Well, simply from the displacement values. So let's go back to here. So we know our gauge length, our original gauge, gauge length is 27. So our changing length is our displacement divided by our original length, which is our gauge length. Now if I hit function F4 on a Mac, what this does is it puts these dollar signs around this um, cell and a row value here. And what that does is it simply it uses that as a reference. So if I copy that formula down, every single one of these cells references this gauge length. Now there's a few ways of doing this. I could literally type in 27 and I get exactly the same. I could do that. What you don't want to do is reference a cell like this. So if I did go back to gauge length and just left it at B5 and if I... Yeah, you can start to see now that as you move down that we start to reference a different um, different cell altogether. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to do it the original way. Uh, in fact, I'm going to do it another way now. I'm going to just literally type in the dollar signs and that will do it as well. So that's it. That's our strain. What about our stress? What does stress equal? Strain's got no unit, by the way. 
yes? Millimetres divided by millimetres, they cancel each other out. Well, stress, what are we going to work stress in? Uh, let's have a little look. So what is stress? What's the equation for stress? Engineering stress, here we are. It's the load, P. Um, we call it P in this case. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. The load, P, divided by our, by our cross-sectional area. Ah, okay, so we need to do something else. So we know our load, that's our force, force that we measured, yeah, from the tensile test, and our cross-sectional area. Well, we know that this was a cylindrical sample, and it had a diameter of 5 millimetres. So if I want to work out the cross-sectional area, so it's just CSA for short, equals pi multiplied by the radius squared. That's the cross-sectional area of a circle. So, on Excel, you have to write capital PI, I think, or it may not, may not be capitals, and you have to put the brackets after it. Multiplied by the radius squared. Well, there's way few ways we can do this. I can either just simply halve the diameter, and which we know is 2.5, or what I'll say is this cell here divided by 2, which will do exactly the same thing to the power of, which is that little hat symbol, 2. And I'm not sure whether we have to put another set of brackets here. It doesn't really harm to do it. That's the number I was looking for, 19.6. So stress, what's our unit for stress? Well, we the, there's many units for stress. It's, it's stress is technically, it's pressure. Um, you could use pounds per square inch, or we could use megapascals. Or Pascals even. Now I'll try and explain why I'm going to be using megapascals. First of all, that tends to be the sort of standard unit that people quote when it comes to um, doing tensile tests of these types of materials. It gives you very nice numbers. Um, but what is a Pascal? Well, let's have a look. So one newton meter squared is one Pascal. One newton per millimeter squared gives us one megapascal. Well, that's quite handy because our machine gives us force in newtons, and we have just figured out our cross-sectional area in millimeter squared. So, one newton millimeter squared equals one megapascal. So our stress is simply the force divided by our cross-sectional area. And again, we have to do the F four business. And we get stress here. Now then, I'm going to retitle this chart Force versus Extension. Extension. Alright. So that's the force versus extension curve. And now I'm going to plot stress versus strain. I'm going to do exactly the same thing. And there we go. There is our stress versus strain curve. And it was as simple as that. There it is. It's exactly the same shape as the force extension curve. And there it is. Brilliant. So, how do we work out the ultimate tensile stress? How do we work out the Young's modulus? How do we do all that sort of thing? But if I open up an example of what I've done before, so this is the instructions I've given um, to do exactly what I just did there. I've done things in a slightly different way. There's some funny things going on here as well, but uh, the data I've given you, actually, I've done this step for you to make it a bit easier. But what I wanted to do is have a look at the stress strain curve which I think is exactly the same one as we've got previously. I'll have a look. It may not be. 350. Uh, no, it's not the same one. It doesn't matter. It behaves in the same way. So first of all, what's our Young's modulus? Well, that's really the, the gradient here, the gradient of the elastic portion of the curve. Materials with lower Young's modulus have a lower gradient. Materials with high Young's modulus have a steeper gradient. So that's well. I'll do a, a separate video to working at the Young's modulus because it can be quite be quite tricky actually. This is a steel and usually with these types of steels we get this area of discontinuous um, yielding which I said there makes it quite difficult to define a yield point 
I'd probably accept a yield pointer there. Sometimes what we do is we use a, an offset yield point. Um, so we offset the strain here by a certain amount. And we read off the yield point there. About 0.2%. I, um, I think I've seen that. So that's our yield stress there. Where we go from elastic deformation and we start getting into plastic permanent deformation. What's the UTS? Well, it's the maximum. It's the maximum stress here. So how do we work that out? Well, it's not that difficult, actually. We could just say, well, the UTS is simply the max of this column here, stress. And that will give us our ultimate tensile strength, which everybody likes to see. Well, our yield strength, we just talked about that. It's a little bit more, um, um, should we say, subjective. Um, well, it doesn't need to be. In this case, it is. Our elastic plus plastic so what's that? Elastic plus plastic strain to failure. Well, if you have a look at the tensile stress, that's this here. That's the maximum strain that we got. Now, how do you work that out? Well, again, that's quite easy. It's really just the maximum of this column here. So that's done there. And the actual plastic strain to failure. Well, if you were going to work out the plastic strain to failure, you'd have to sort of get rid of this you have to get rid of all of the strain values up to this point here, up to the yield place you've defined to find the yield point. So, really, although it might be a bit sort of unintuitive to think about this at this time, but really it's just taking this, superimposing a line of the gradient, taking it to the right hand side of the curve, and you know that taking this portion off here, which should be equal to this portion here, and that's your sort of plastic strain to failure. Um, what else can I say? Uh, we won't talk about Young's modulus yet in this particular case. But this is a, a way of sort of working it out here. So hopefully that was useful. Uh, if it isn't, just sort of write in the comments or send me an email or whatever. Um, and, and just tell me why it was and maybe I can improve it somehow. Uh, thank you for that and bye.